Hello, I'm Chris Schufo from Military Embedded Systems Magazine, and I'm here interviewing Justin Deister with Black Diamond Technologies, Advanced Technologies. Yes. So we were just talking a little bit about Black Diamond, so why don't you give us the overview? Sure. So the company uh, was started back in 2000, July of 2005. Uh, myself and three other gentlemen formed the company. And uh, we started developing uh, rugged computer products, um, primarily commercial, industrial, and military-centric. And uh, the, the nature of those computer products was, was kind of different than things that had been designed in the past. We're all, three of the founders were former weapons designers from Raytheon Missile Systems in Tucson. Mm, okay. So when we designed computers, we didn't really design them like a typical computer's design. We designed them more like a missile's design. And that had some inherent features um, from rugged ability to the way we handle all of our I.O., the way we handle uh, some of the uh, built-in tests and things, you know, things that, that kind of bring a lot of value in, in the rugged environment. And uh, those computers were, uh, well, computer probably primarily turned into a switchback. And uh, that computer's been in production now for, for since 2006, and um, you know it's 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 deployed with the with the military in all of the world. Um, we got into the wearable computing market in about 2007 uh, with uh, the Israeli Defense Force. Um, we um, developed a uh, wearable computing system for them, mm -hmm. and subsequently won the uh, production contract for that system. It's part of the Digital Army Program, or DAP, in Israel, and uh, which there's a sub-program underneath that called DAX, D-A-C-S, which is the Digital Army Computer System, and that's what we developed for the Israeli Defense Force. What are the technology requirements then? Um, primarily had to interoperate with the radio systems. What was, radio? We're talking Singars, we're talking JRS, um, what are we talking radio wise? Or primarily Harris radios and, and Talus radios on the battlefield. Yeah. Um, so if I was to give you radios by name, it'd be the 117 Golf, 152, uh, 148 Gem. Um, yeah. Yep. So the, so the 148, the 152, the 117 Golf and Foxtrot. Uh, the uh, CNRS radio, mm -hmm. uh, rif you know the rifleman radio, yep. uh, so the Microlight E Plus radio yep. system. So those were the primary radio systems we had to interface with. Um, we needed to be able to run existing software applications, things like Falcon View, things like BAO Kit for targeting applications. Um, we needed to so every Windows-based application that was yep. out there, everything from running. Uh, robots, unmanned ground vehicles, to running unmanned aerial vehicles. Mm -hmm. So we went and looked at what are those software applications they're using, what devices are they using, what platforms are they currently running them on, primarily Panasonic tough books, things of that nature. So we needed a Windows-based system. Got it. Um, the, the requirements for processing capability were re really balanced relative to size and power um, and thermal dissipation. So we really, we had to step back and we had to look at, okay, what is the optimum processor, what's the optimum amount of memory needed, and trade that versus battery life and the logistics of getting power downrange, because that is a huge issue. And there were two schools of thought there. There was one school of thought, make it as light and as, as power efficient as possible. And the other school of thought was, I don't care how many batteries I have to carry, when I need it to work, it must work and it must work quickly. Must, must always you know, be very quick. And primarily it's imagery data, right? Panning imagery data around, uh, you know, sub-meter, full-color imagery data uh, can be very graphics intensive. So mostly situational awareness, call for fire sorts of things. Yes, We're yes. Talking reconnaissance sort yeah, of Yeah, reconnaissance, uh, targeting, you know, JTAC type roles, mm -hmm. um, communications, biometrics type stuff for human intelligence, you know, yeah. sensitive site exploitation, things of that nature. Mm -hmm. So, being able to manipulate that data and then send that data back out over, over a, a type one encrypted radio network is, mm -hmm. is very important. Yeah. Um, so the, we, we actually built two variants of the system. We built a variant that was less power than this, that was less performance than this, and we built a variant that was much higher performance than this and much more power. And we took both of the field. And what we determined was neither was right. Right, so we settled on a solution that was in between. So we needed an I/O capability that allowed the operator to either have it or not. So have the I/O capability or not, and 
ad hocly be able to plug in the standard commercial connectors while still maintaining our level, level of ruggedability, our, our EMI performance, and everything else. Basically four elements to the system that I'm going to show you today, okay? There's the display part. There's the GPS, okay? There's the, what we call the tactical mission controller. And so, the CPU, if you will. I don't like to call it that mm -hmm. because that's, that's not fair. That's not a fair assessment of what this thing is doing. Yes, it has a CPU in it. Mm -hmm. It also has a power manager in it. So it's doing power regulation and power distribution. So I can power your ISR receiver. You don't need a battery on it. It's coming from here. I can power your 5-watt radio. You don't need to put a battery on it anymore. Okay. And I can run everything off one power. So it's really a power distribution, a, com a computational computing element to it, mm -hmm. but it's really the hub of the spoke on the soldier. Sure. Because I've got all these ancillary devices, well this brings them all together. This now meshes all these technologies together. Mm -hmm. And okay. it's convection cooled, I see. Obviously no moving yes, parts. Yes, no moving parts, parts. Completely solid state. Sure. I mean, um, so it has a series of connectors around the outside of it that are very strategically located. The shape of the device itself is... Um, they all look like 38 triple nines and such. They're, they're a sealed circular military connector. Um, um, each one's different. And, and, what, and what I'll do is, is we'll just kind of take it apart. The best thing to do is just take it apart and let you guys play with it. So you saw how easy it was to remove it mm -hmm. off of the system. Um, the same with the cables. And what you'll also notice is the cables are all color-coded. This system only has one comms connector. The production system has two. So we actually can control up to three radios at once off the system. So these would be radios that the... Uh, right, they would be in a radio pouches that are on the soldier, but they're cabled back and running onto this, and I'm feeding them power, and, uh, and I'm uh, doing digital communications through them, okay, and audio. Um, the next is the UTD, or Universal Tactical Display, which is on the front here that you saw. Right. Next one over is our ISR uh, port, or we call it the VDL port primary video downlink. We're using that uh, for uh, UAVs, micro UAVs, to um, getting pod feeds off of big aircraft. So that's your receiver port. So Predator, Global Hawk, mm -hmm. Dragon Eye, anything else yep. they've got yep. flying around, or even maybe some yep. of the, the rolling ones, like the uh, the iRobot ones. Yes, yep. uh, the pack bot. Sub-V and stuff, yep. yeah. Cool. Yep. So that's your receiver port that basically allows you to bring in that video stream into the system. Next over is battery, and we take any 9 to 35 volt mil standard 1275 power input. So what that means to you on the battlefield is plug it into whatever you want. Uh, the IO hub is actually sitting down here, and all I'll do is I'll just pull it out. And, and it's designed to be down in here so you can it. What kind of comments do you get about that? Um, just people wanting different, everything from different ports, different connectivity, different ports on the system to, um, you know, don't orient it like this, orient it like that, don't put this there, put that there. So just, just all kinds of feedback on, on that, on that, on this, on this piece here. We've actually, in the production version, is actually going to be thinner than this, and we've changed some of the connections out of it uh, based on, on the consolidated feedback we've gotten from the several units that have tested it. Um, so on the top of it, all the ports are sealed, so you've got two uh, Type A USBs, you've got an an RS-232-422 port um, here. On the bottom, you've got dual audio channels. So this is basically your left and right channel with mic input. Mm -hmm. um, we use that for language translation. We also use that to wiretap the radio audio so that I can record an audio transmission back and forth, like okay. for instance, between me and an aircraft. Mm -hmm. If I was doing a call for fire mm -hmm. and I wanted to record that for either training purposes or for reporting later, whatever, I could have the old audio file. Mm -hmm. Um, this is your power input here. So this is like if you jumped in a vehicle, and now I'm in the vehicle, and I don't want to run off my battery, I want to run vehicle power. power, I can plug in and now run off my mounted power, right, until I need to jump back out. Um, and then that goes back to the, to the computer itself. Um, there's a zero-wise button here on this as well. And that's something we haven't talked about is information insurance that we've designed into the product. Mm -hmm. And so that will zero-wise all of the storage? That will, that will zero-wise the storage within this system and could be used to send commands out to remote zero-wise other devices. I'm going to go over that. I'll take that side of here and show you. Um, the display has, has some cable on it here. And the reason for that is this is probably the only cable you'll see on our system. Um, it's primarily because this device is used not only for the individual operator, but it's also used for other people. 
So if I was the ground forces commander, for instance, and I walked up and this guy had the equipment, he could hand me this, he could pull this off and hand this to me. I could stand next to him, manipulate whatever I wanted to see or do and hand it back to him. Or for instance, say we are part of the uh, Afghan National Army and we are moving out to an objective and this guy is going to tell us what our mission is. He can now turn the display around and show us. So if a picture is worth a thousand words, what's a moving map worth? Right? When you don't speak their language and you don't, you're not part of their culture. Right? So those things are very, very valuable um, to, the, to the end customer community to be able to do that. What about uh, embedded training? Uh, if you're going to do any embedded training, what capabilities does it have to run scenarios or provide any, any feedback for any sort of embedded training? Or on fly uh, mission preparedness, when, when you're going to quickly deploy and they really don't know where they're deploying to, and you've got intel that's going to be downloaded to the system and they can bring it up. So embedded training and, and rapid deployment capabilities, does it have all of that? I mean, it'll do anything a PC will do, right? So anything, anything, any type of simulation software, any type of software that's running on a, on a, on a PC, the system will run. Uh, we're on Windows 7 on it. Um, redundant feature, so it's got a glove finger compatible touch screen. Oh, good. Okay, so five wire resistive is what we typically use. Reason for that is you can cut it, you can take a gouge out of it, and it'll still work up to the edge where the gouge or the cut is. So very redundant. It also has an optical pointing device here. So you'll yeah. see here, it's it's a trackball thing. It's not yeah. a trackball. So run your thumb over the top of it. Oh. Okay, and then you have a left and right mouse click here. Um, hmm. On-screen keyboard that we can put away or bring up. Um, our system boots to this screen right here. And this is running on top of XP. Uh huh. Yeah. So so I mean, this is you know, here's your start menu, start all oh, programs. Okay. You know. So, so it is so, XP. Yeah, this one is XP. What we did is we wrote a software application because this. Under a high stress condition, when you're getting shot at, is not you can't find accessible. It. You can't, you can't do this. So yeah. what we did is we created this software application. We call it Launchpad, and it's like an iPhone. Uh -huh. And you can drag and drop your icons right on top of the the display. And what this allows you to do is um, create quick shortcut on one menu based system that you can launch applications. Um, on top of that, what we learned was is that guys started using this. And then they decided yeah. there were there were typical things in the primary JTAC specific. So I was at a location mm -hmm. and there was a Reaper overhead mm -hmm. and there were two F sixteens overhead and an AC one thirty. Okay. And there was a uh, combat controller, uh, JTAC, who was trying to control this airspace and I was watching them do this. Ground based? Ground based. Right, and so we had ISR feed coming in. We had, you know, we had aircraft in different altitudes checking in at different places, and he was controlling all of this aircraft, right, and watching a threat on the ground and trying not to get shot at, and so on and so forth. And so when you're doing that without a system like this, what you typically have is you have some rover device giving you an ISR feed. You've got your maps, you've got your radio, you got a piece of paper out. And you, and you hope nobody's shooting at you. Right, and you're jumping from thing to thing to thing to thing to thing. Now, if you're a little more technically savvy, now you got a Panasonic Tough Book or an MR1 out, and then a cable mess that's just going everywhere trying to plug all this crap in and get it to work, which typically they're not doing. They're, they're typically looking at a paper map and talking the aircraft onto the target, which works if you can see everything and you know where everybody's at. Um, very busy person, right? It's going to his map, it's on his radio. He's got his binoculars up or his targeting device. He's getting back to his ISR feed. He's back to his map. You know, and he's doing this over and over and over and over. And so, watching that, um, we came up with an idea of a very quick way to launch your applications. And, and, and what it is, is we patented this software. This was something else that we patented, which, which is kind of, again, very stupid. <laughs> it's not very smart, but it, it's kind of interesting. So, what this is, is we call this app config. And you'll see here there's a little screenshot um, that shows you a little image there. And what that is, is the guy can tile on his screen. And what this software does, it just remembers what applications you had open and how you had them tiled. Mm -hmm. So with one button press, I can launch all of those applications and tile them on the screen. So if I was somewhere, my computer's off, I hit the power button, it boots. You saw how long it took it to boot. I hit that button, all my apps launch. Now they're all on the screen in the location where I want them to go. All configured, ready to go. So that allows the operator very quickly to get on station and be up and operational. You know, because a lot of times these targets 
shoot and scoot, right? And would this be the same display you'd see in your HMD if that were plugged into yes. that? Mm -hmm. okay. Yes. Um, so the, the display itself is uh, fully sun, or sunlight readable. How many and nits is it? You know, that's a term we don't use, and I'll tell you why. Nits is a very poor measure of sunlight viewability, because I can have a very low nit display that is very small and be very, very sunlight viewable. I can have that same nit display that is very large and you won't be able to see it at all. Mm -hmm. The reason is because it's how much light and how big's the pipe. Okay. So think of it that in terms, right? So we don't typically do things by nit rating. Um, it is a variable backlight that we control, um, so much so that we actually even know how to modulate it to put it into NVG mode. So now this display is in NVG mode right if you've now. you've got your goggles on. Uh -huh. And you notice all the LEDs have turned off, even the LED on the computer is off. And it will stay off. It will persist this way. So if I lose the battery, if I unplug this display, take it off my kit, and stick it on your kit, it will boot in NVG mode. So it will not illuminate you in a low light condition. It will remember that forever until you take it back out of NVG mode, which we have mapped to a set of keys. We'll let you do that. Mm -hmm. um, our system, like I told you earlier, is a lot more like a missile than a computer. Um, the processor is a slave to the FPGA, primarily. Oh. And so when the system booted, it actually performed its, its own bit in parallel as the system was running. So it checked all its power supplies, it did all that, and it, it gave you a, a bit results. And I'll actually, it shows them in here as well. Um, this is telling us battery power indication here. So this is telling me about what batteries I have connected. So I have a, uh, this is giving me my, all my smart battery information, how much battery life I have left to go, my approximate run time of my battery remaining. Uh, this is my internal backup battery. So if I unplug that battery, this will light up and it tells me how much longer I have that. I can also set my uh, backlight dim time, shut off time, everything else from the, the display. Pretty high tech. Yeah. You have to have a technical soldier. Uh, yeah, we tried to make it though where it was kind of simple, right? Power. If you want anything about power, there's all your power options. Notice the buttons are big and fat. I can use my finger, gloved finger, right? Um, same thing here. I can edit my buttons. So all these buttons around here are reprogrammable. So with this button editor, I can go in here and I can edit these to be whatever I want them to be, to launch an application, to be arrow keys, to whatever. Wow, it's pretty impressive. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of modularity to it. I guess the, so you're hoping to sell this in production through your prime, or are you also uh, selling this on the open market to other programs as well? Yeah, this is a commercial COTS product. As far as we're concerned, this is a COTS product. And so it sell is, it to we have a price list, and it's on the market, and you know, come get it.